Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to hear our visitor, Dr. Fred Brill of Lafayette, speak on his district's recent experience in modifying its approach to gate education. And if you can shuffle toward the middle so that latecomers might be able to find a seat, then um, I think that will be great. My name is Karen Hamilton. I'm a deputy state public defender, and I have had children enrolled in Davis schools continuously over the last 15 years. I have two kids who went through the Spanish immersion program and are now in college, and also I have a daughter enrolled in the fifth grade gate classroom at Willett Elementary. This event has been planned by numerous individual Davis residents who are parents of students presently and previously enrolled in Davis schools. These include Jill Van Zanten, Kathy Sachs, Jan Marie Garcia, Laura Anderson, Laura Lynn Palmer, and Maureen Libet. As a group, we cover the full spectrum. We have children who have been a gate identified, some, some of whom have been placed in uh, self-contained gate classes, we also have children who have refrained from being uh, tested for the GATE program and uh, children who have been enrolled in the regular classrooms. We, in hosting this event, none of us are acting in affiliation with any school, the district, or any dis district officers or staff. We all care about the district and the success and well-being of all of its children. And I'm sure that that is true for everyone in this room. We heard about developments in the Lafayette District and we're delighted to learn that Dr. Brill was willing to come and share that story. I see that several of our district leaders have joined us tonight, including President Sue Levenberg of the school board, Vice President Sheila Allen, and other district uh, staff and administrators and we thank them all for attending. We have heard from other individuals and community leaders who wanted to be here tonight but couldn't be here, and so we're having the talk filmed for future reference. Thanks very much to Davis Media Access for doing that. Also, thanks very much to Harper Junior High School Principal Zena Ingalls for her part in making it possible for this event to be held on her campus. On your seat, you should find two index cards. One is for you to jot down a question you may have for Dr. Brill. Please pass the cards with your question down to the aisles where Kathy and Jill will be collecting them throughout the program. To save time, we will organize the questions and direct as many as possible to Dr. Brill do during a Q&A session following his presentation. We have promised him that he won't have to go home too late as he does have to drive back to the Bay Area and get ready to go to work in the morning. The other card uh, that you find is for you to put down any comments about this event or suggestions that you would like to see addressed going forward and to provide your contact information if you would like to be included in a continuing conversation over the next few months. At this point, we haven't made any plans to form a book or discussion group, but we might consider that if there is a lot of interest. We would like to invite other speakers to Davis so that we can continue to learn about alternative approaches to GATE. If you have ideas of or leads to possible future speakers, please note those down on your card along with your contact information. When you leave, please drop the second card in the bag, which you'll find by the door here. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Fred Braille, superintendent of the Lafayette School District and an instructor in UC Berkeley's Principal Leadership Institute. After receiving a BA in education from the University of Michigan, Dr. Brill earned a master's degree in secondary education from San Francisco State University and a doctorate in education in policy, organization, measurement, and evaluation from UC Berkeley. Dr. Brill has served as a middle school principal, a high school and continuation high school English teacher, and a special education teacher at the elementary school level. He also served as the area superintendent of the middle school network in the Oakland Unified School District before returning to the, Laf to Lafay to the Lafayette District in his present role in 2008. The Lafayette District recently has transformed its gate program from one like ours in Davis, with 20 to 30 percent of students enrolled in self-contained classes, to one where less than 4 percent of gate-identified students choose self-contained classes. 
and the vast majority stay in their neighborhood or home schools where they are served by teachers who are well-trained in differentiated instruction and who receive steady support to teach under that approach. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brill to Davis. Thank you. So I met Jan Murray Garcia oh, a few weeks back, maybe a couple months back, and she asked if it'd be okay if I came out to have coffee with a few parents. This is not what I was expecting. It is uh, really good to be here, and I feel honored to be around a group of clearly very passionate parents and educators. And I appreciate the introduction that we are all here for our kids. And I want to say I, I feel blessed to be associated with the field of education. I think uh, it is the highest honor because of the profound responsibility for we ha that we have for serving all of our kids. Neither one of my parents nor my grandparents went to college. And they made a lot of sacrifices so my brother, my sister, and I could go to college. And um, I continue to see education as the great equalizer in our society, something that provides all of our kids with opportunities. And, and I take that responsibility very, very seriously. Jan, why don't we do a little click here. So um, you've covered um, some of the different roles that I've had, and I do want to also share with you, uh, I have four children. I, I am in a blended family. Um, our kids have gone to the Albany schools and the Berkeley schools. Two of the children were gate identified, two were not. Um, all four of them are currently in college, and for that I am thankful. It feels good to be an empty nester. Uh, on a very separate note, I had to tell my son when he came back after graduating actually for Davis, he's now in grad school, that, was, that there was only room in a home for one alpha male, and it was not him. So where do I want to go here? My wife is also an educator, and, and she is another gift that came to me through education. She was part of a PQR process, a program quality review coming to an elementary school, and the other uh, principal in the district set me up with her. She's now a principal in the uh, West Contra Costa Unified School District. She works in Richmond in the Iron Triangle. That's very different from Lafayette, which is a very affluent uh, population uh, that's primarily white and Asian. And uh, you can imagine what our dinnertime conversations are like. I will also say uh, that I, throughout my career, have had a very strong passion for alternative education. I taught emotionally disturbed kids. That was my first teaching position. I taught at a continuation high school. Uh, when I was in Oakland, I started a community day school for kids. And I continue to see gaps in all systems about how we're serving kids. What I also want to say by way of disclaimer is I'm not an expert on GATE by any means. I'm an educator. I've been uh, in the field since 1985. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily one way to provide program for kids. All communities are different. But I will say something, and you'll see this as a recurring theme. Our decisions and our actions are a reflection of our values. And I want to make sure that we come back to that as we talk about how we're serving kids. So the first part of this presentation, and why don't we flip here? Um, the first part of this presentation is going to be a zillion quotes. And um, I'll do the first couple, and then I'm going to ask a couple people to help me read them so you don't get sick of my voice. We're not going to stop and talk about them, but what I wanted to do was provide some historical context about how we have done schooling in America over the past 250 years. So uh, the first, um, let me throw some stuff here. I thought my computer was going to be by my side, so bear with me here. Okay. 
So the first quote here that I wanted to read, which is up on the screen for folks in the back, purpose is more nearly defined by the aggregate of action taken than by any formulation in words. Um, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, uh, your actions speak so loudly I cannot hear your words. And it's a nice quote to keep about. Going to the next slide, there's a, uh, an educational researcher named Labory, and I really like his framing in terms of the multiple purposes of education. His argument is because we have fl conflicting goals that we are, are somewhat schizophrenic in what we deliver and the kinds of results we get. He identifies three different purposes of education. One is democratic equality for citizens. Everyone needs to be educated so that they can participate fully in a democratic society. It's for the public good. The second model that he suggests is one for what he calls social efficiency. It's for workers. And this is something that he believes that we have done in the past. So we track kids. There will be those that do academic or white collar jobs and those will be, there'll be others who will do blue collar jobs or trade type jobs. And schools can play a role in providing different pathways for career and the workplace. Finally, education is seen by some for social mobility purposes. And this is a focus on the individual. And education under this model is seen as providing private benefit. Um, I read one study that for every year of college a kid goes to beyond high school, their salary will increase by about $7,000 on average. Doesn't mean that all kids who go to college will make up more money, but that's just one statistic. There is economic value with education, and we all know that. Okay, this will be the last quote I we read for a while, and then I think it's going to be Mike, and who else are going to be my quote readers? Mike and Laura, great. So I want to read this one. So back in 1781, Thomas Jefferson, when he was talking about schooling, wrote, trial is to be made at the grammar schools, and the best genius of the whole selected and continued six years, and the residue dismissed. The best geniuses will be raked from the rubbish annually and be instructed. One half are to be discontinued. Frightening. That's my only commentary. So uh, why don't we here go to Mike. Why don't you read this next one? This is just so you don't get sick of me. Education, is it going? No. Yeah, it. Education beyond all other devices of human origin is the great equalizer of the conditions of men, the balance wheel of social machinery. Keep going. Read that next one, please. Purpose of schooling was to create a unique American culture and character that could be used to mold the large number of recent immigrants into our country. This would include instructing the young in the blessings of democracy and, be, and become full participants in it. Laura, take us to Harvard. <laughs> every subject which is taught should be taught in the same way and to the same extent to every pupil so long as he pursues it, no matter what the probable destination of the pupil may be. Okay, let's jump up to 1918. Cardinal principles of secondary education. Different curricula for different students. Tracking is reinforced to prevent students from dropping out. Academic track, commercial, industrial, and mechanical track. So you see we're swinging back again. So Bowles and Gintis, two um, people who are re educational researchers, they talk about social reproduction, that that's what schools do. Laura. Schools socialize students to meet the demands they will be expected to assume within the existing class structure. Social relationships and interactions are structured to fragment students into stratified groups where different capabilities, attitudes, and behaviors are rewarded through the illusion of a meritocratic educational system. 
She has a bias, clearly. So um, I, I'm not going to read this next one. Um, sit tight, Mike, because I'll probably call you in here. So, well, maybe I will. Um, early test pioneer Lewis Turnin. Every step, and this is from 1916, uh, and this is when we first started sorting kids through the use of different types of assessments. Every step in the child's progress should be taken into account of his vocational possibilities. Preliminary investigations indicate that an IQ below 70 rarely permits anything below unskilled labor. 70 to 80 is preeminently that of semi-skilled labor, labor, 80 to 90, that of skilled or ordinary clerical labor, 100 to 110 or 15, that of semi-professional. Um, those above will be permitted into the professions of the larger fields of business. This information will be of great value in planning the education of a particular child and also in planning the differentiated curriculum recommended. So students had their place laid out right from the beginning. That, that was one of the purposes in designing some of these assessments. Jeannie Oakes explains that when uh, psychometricians design these types of standardized assessments, that they'll come up with a bunch of questions and then they will typically throw out 60% of the items if too many kids are getting them right because it's not providing the sorting mechanism that the assessments are designed to do. Um, Mike, can you read this next one, please? More from Jeannie Oaks, 1985. Tracking seems to be, or seems to retard the academic progress of many students, those in average and low groups. Tracking seems to foster low self-esteem among these same students and promote school misbehavior and dropping out. Tracking also seems to lower the aspirations of students who are not in the top groups. Tracking separates students along socioeconomic lines separating rich from poor, whites from non-whites. Okay, next one. L Laura, please. Arnie Duncan. In America, education remains the great equalizer. In liberal democracies, the hope springs eternal that expanding educational opportunity will increase social mobility and reduce social inequality. Okay, let's go to Carol Dweck here. Um, Mike, would you read this one, please? Students who view their intelligence as an unchangeable internal characteristic tend to shy away from academic challenges, whereas students who believe that their intelligence can be increased through effort and persistence seek them out. Okay, raise your hand if you're familiar with Carol Dweck's research. So we got a few folks here. Let me share with you one of her seminal studies, which has been replicated among different age groups, genders, racial groups, different backgrounds, and the results have been consistently the same. I think it's fascinating. What she basically did was she provide, provided an assessment that was very easy, and she broke two groups. And on one half, she told the group, um, she'd have them take a, a series of questions, and they got them all right, and she'd say, you are brilliant, you are so smart. The second group, they also did equally well, and she told that group, you did great, you must have worked incredibly hard. And then she'd say, do you want to do some more? And both groups would say, of course. And the tests, of course, got progressively harder. So now they were missing a couple. And they, she'd say, you did so fantastic. Do you want to keep going? Yes. How about you? Do you want to keep going? Oh, of course we do. Now they brought the kids to a certain level where they were struggling. They were getting most of the questions wrong. What happened? The group that was told and encouraged in this very brief limited period of time that they were smart and brilliant and highly capable said, I'm done. I don't want to go anymore. The group that was told, you've been working so hard, do you want to try some more? They said, yes. They said, I want to keep going. I didn't read about this study till I was in grad school. I missed the boat as a parent and an educator. What we have focused on, and I believe, and this is, this is a strong statement I want to make, when we focus on intelligence and consider it to be something that is fixed, we are shortchanging our children. And there's profound evidence in the field 
that we, I mean, we know that SAT scores, even IQ tests with proper coaching and preparation, we can move those numbers. So one of the things, and, and I, I guess I'll go through this uh, a little more. Let's uh, switch to the next slide here. So just to give you the hard data, 66% of the pupils who were praised for being smart and selected the easy task um, said they didn't want, um, as they didn't want to take the chance of losing their intelligence label. But 90% of the group who were praised for their effort selected the harder test as they wanted to maintain their hardworking images. The group praised for intelligence this is unbelievable to me, demonstrated a 20% decrease in, per in performance in comparison with the first test, though it was no more complex. The effort praised group increased their score by 30%. Failure had actually spurred them on. This is, uh, uh, if there's one message I want you all to take home to your kids and your students, that's one of the things that we should be focusing on. Things get hard. We're going to face challenges as students, as workers, as friends, as partners, as parents. And we've got to work through it. And we'll talk about grittiness in a little bit. OK, so Daniel Goleman, 1995, Emotional Intelligence. Raise your hand if you've read the book or heard about him. Good. <clears throat> Uh, Mike, can you read that one? Much evidence testifies that people who are emotionally adept, who know the, and manage their own feelings well, and who read and deal with other people's feelings, are at an advantage in any domain in life, whether romance and in intimate relationships or picking up the unspoken rules that govern success in organizational politics. People well developed with well-developed emotional skills are more likely to be content and effective in their lives, mastering habits of mind that foster their own productivity. Okay, so uh, he goes on to say, when I ca calculated the ratio of technical skills, IQ, and emotional intelligence as ingredients of excellent performance, emotional intelligence proved to be twice as important as others for jobs at all levels. The most common reason that folks get fired is not ability to do the job. It's not intelligence. What is it? The ability to hang, to get along with others, all different kinds. And this is something that um, we as educators have a responsibility to emphasize. Character education is incredibly important. Price of privilege, Madeline Levine, Laura. Raising children has come to look more and more like a business endeavor and less and less like an endeavor of the heart. Parents focus more on achievement that their relationship with them. It's a mistake, sorry. sorry. Oh, <laughs> thank you. The relationship with their child. The misguided pressure and expectations from educators and parents has resulted in an increase in the incidence of depression, substance abuse, anxiety, and unhappiness. And unhappiness is increasing at a staggering rate. 20% of early teen girls are depressed. Okay, and this is incredibly pronounced in communities like ours, in communities like Lafayette. Um, our kids are under enormous pressure. And, you know, when I grew up in Chicago as a kid, school was something you did, but it was not your life. Getting into college was so much easier. Um, I talk to a lot of kids who, once they're in college, say the pressure's off. I, I worked so hard to get in, but at what cost? How many of our kids are twitching their way through high school completely sleep deprived over program because of the pressures? And that's something that we have to pay very careful attention to. We, we want, I'm an educator, I love academics and intellectual growth and development, but if we do that to the expense of other portions of our personality, other intelligences, our emotional IQ, we're shortchanging our kids. We're robbing them. They need the downtime. They need the social interactions. They need those skills and tools to be called out and cultivated. We've been working in our district with Dr. Ken Ginsberg. He's a pediatrician 
who does a lot of work on resilience. Uh, whose turn is it here? I think it's you, Mike. We're almost done. You're doing great. We seem to forget that there are different kinds of thinkers and learners. Some of us learn best visually, others through listening, and still others by tackling a problem with our hands. Children with learning differences are not broken. They are different. If parents and teachers find appropriate interventions while reveling in and supporting their children's strengths, they will be just fine. One of the greatest ways to de or destroy confidence is by emphasizing incompetence and shaming children. Okay, this is powerful. So this pediatrician came onto this whole um, notion. Um, he has a movement called Challenge Success. And he's worked a lot in affluent areas like ours. And basically, really deeply concerned with the type of pathology, sicknesses, depression, anxiety, that a lot of the kids he was seeing um, in his practice. And it, it prompted him to look at what we as schools and as parents are doing to our kids where you have to be this person who plays on the soccer team and you're on the swim team and you're getting all A's. And he, he's basically arguing that we're killing our kids and we're emphasizing the wrong things. And that's not what makes healthy, productive adults. Um, so we've had him both work with our teachers and our parents as well as our kids. He's a great, great speaker. Angela Duckworth, any of you read that great New York Times article? Oh, it was, I don't know, maybe six months or a year ago on grittiness. And um, Angela Duckworth is a person who uh, was an inspiration to some of the KIPP schools, and I'll talk about them in a second. But essentially what she argues is that people who accomplish great things combine a passion with unwavering dedication, there's that effort thing, to achieve their mission, whatever their obs the obstacles and however long it might take. She called this quality grit. And there's a, a bunch of schools springing up, a lot of the charter schools, that use a whole rubric based on grittiness. How do we foster that? That when you get stuck, when you struggle, you have to work through that. And one of the ways in which we're changing that in our classrooms in Lafayette is rather than our teachers simply calling on the kid in the front row who always has their hand open, they'll work with the kids. First of all, they give way more opportunities for 100% of the kids to participate, either through whiteboards, show me the problem that you've done. Johnny, explain your thinking. Johnny gets it wrong. Rather than saying, oh no, Johnny, can someone tell him how the right way to do it is? The teachers will hang with Johnny for extended periods of time. The first time I started watching this, I was writhing in the back of the classroom saying, this feels kind of cruel to me. This feels very uncomfortable. What the teachers are doing is creating a space where it's okay to fail as long as we're working through it and figuring out how to think through, make public our thinking, and figuring out how to get it right. Tell me a little bit more about your thinking. I don't know. Well, if you did know, what might you say? <laughs> Powerful question. What are some of the things you're sure that you don't know about? I've seen kids applaud others when Johnny, who's been struggling for five, 10 minutes, gets the answer. The other huge change that I'm seeing, especially in the math classes, is this is not the algorithm that you need to do 30 times at home. We're working so much more on comp, you know, uh, um, conceptual understanding and problem solving. What does that look like? Here's a complex problem, it's a word problem. Your job is to come up with five different ways to solve this problem. Not the way, five different ways. Afterwards, the kids show on their fingers what they got. Let's see the different ways. What we're building here is a number sense that kids don't get from doing the repetition one way. And we'll be talking about the common core in just a little bit. So I want to talk about um, a couple of different schools that, that have been identified in the literature. Uh, when I was in Oakland, I oversaw a school, a, a KIPP school. Raise your hand if you know about Knowledge is Power program schools. They're really, really cool. Um, and, and there's a, a bunch of stories associated with it, but I'll try and restrain myself. 
KIPP schools tend to work, they tend to be charter schools, and they tend to work in high areas of poverty, primarily with African American, Latino kids, um, and a lot of English language learners. They're, you know how all of our schools, we all have great mission statements and vision statements and 21st century skills and all. Theirs is really simple, work hard, be nice. That's it. Work hard, be nice. They have another, um, a bunch of other little comments that go along with it. There are signs all over the school. There are no shortcuts, no excuses. Teachers have very high expectations for all the kids. Where this was really, really, now I will also say one of the things that they provide that we don't provide is their school goes from 8 in the morning till 5, 5.30 at night. Saturday schools, teachers are required to be available to kids from 5.30 till 9 o'clock at night every night, five days a week. It's part of their contract. They get results. They give the time that ki some kids need, all kids need, to be able to make meaning and learn the standards. They don't move on. They'll, they'll give the extra time for the kids. It was the highest performing middle school in Oakland when I was there. What ended up happening was the teacher union said that they felt like the working conditions for the teachers were inhumane. They felt like it wasn't okay. 100% of the teachers had signed on to be in that school. The KIPP school said, we don't want to have teachers who don't believe in our mission and don't want to be here. They can work here. This is a choice. Admittedly, they turned over a lot of teachers. They got a lot of young Teach for America folks, right? But they got results. So the school, the district, we asked for, for a side letter to be able to continue this school. And um, it, it was very, very sad for me because I felt like I was gonna be at a table where historic things were happening, where we were supporting an education that did not allow for schools, did, that did not, did, I'm sorry, that did not allow for failure, that did not support kids, that said, we will do whatever it takes to make sure all of our children are successful. And we know it's hard, but we're not gonna send our kids out and we're not gonna send them to the reading lab. We're gonna own our children, all of them, and be responsible for their success. And uh, again, I remember they're saying, well, we're not sure the general membership is gonna go for this, and I remember my, my, what I considered to be my best line was, Darwin is shrie shrieking at you saying, adapt or die. You are gonna lose all these teachers from your union membership if you don't allow them to continue that which they want to do. They chose not to do that. KIPP School continues in West Oakland, providing great service for kids. They're a charter school now. That's fine. What's important for me is that kids are being effectively served. I love the model that teachers show, display the commitment um, to make that, that difference. And, and I want to say, I know the teachers in Davis are rock stars. I know they give life, life's blood. I know that people do not enter this profession for the stock options or anything else. But I believe that our schools are not structured so that all children can be successful. We know that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So um, this next slide is, is interesting, and I do want to read something to you, if, if I may. So when I was in grad school, um, I started getting very, very interested in educational leadership and what is the role of a principal or an instructional leader in moving instruction. And my first work I at Berkeley was part of the tier two credentialing program and I would meet with um, new leaders, new assistant principals and principals once a month. And they would come in after a, a full day's work. Um, I almost swore, but I was very good. Looking terrible. Um, they, they would be rumpled, they, brows were furled, they were just exhausted. And one of the first activities I'd have them do is I started giving them prompts. 
And I started um, ha wanting to hear their stories. And really, the stories from these new leaders just poured out of these folks. They were trying to make meaning of this very complex work. And that ended up being um, the basis of, of both my dissertation and a book I wrote called Leading and Learning. And it's, a, it's an aggregate of 246 stories that new leaders tell. And they typically came in somewhat um, idealistic and looking for ways to change some systems. And, and you know, I, I identify in this book the different roles they play, how they make decisions, how they navigate intense emotion, and ultimately, how they inhabit this funky role of a school leader. So I want to read one story um, from one of the leaders that, that resonated, and I think it's related to our topic today, and then I will share some of the stories of what we have done in Lafayette. Um, so, so Mark is a person, um, and it's a little bit long, so hang with me here. And this was a, a great way to do a dissertation because I'm a former English teacher, I loved writing, and it's like, oh, you could use stories as a means of promoting professional growth and development. And it is one of the ways in which we make meaning of new situations. So Mark writes, so who gets into these honors sections is what I started to look at. In the science and math class, it's sequential, and foreign languages too. It's pretty much how you take them, the sequence. There's not a lot of discussion there. If you're in fourth year Spanish, it's automatically AP class you're in. If you've gotten into pre-calculus, well, you show up at AP calculus. However, the issue in English, in our English curriculum, we have this honors freshman year, honors class sophomore year, but junior and senior years, you, got, um, you get the extra grade point average to be in these classes. And what I found out is they have a quota system. The quota system was pretty much based on the number of sections that this department wanted to offer. So it didn't have anything to do with the student's ability. And I uncovered this kind of accidentally because all of a sudden I heard there was going to be a list that was going to be posted and only the kids on the list were going to be allowed in. In fact, the data clerk was telling me that every year she gets a list and then pulls out all kinds of honor, um, pulls all the kids out of honors class if they're not on this magic list. And it was disjointed. It wasn't alphabetized. And they had these scores that were supposedly based on some sort of assessments. A writing test they had done, a reading test they had taken, teacher recommendation, I don't know. They had some formula, which I have to admit was not too impressive. But I didn't even bother to fully analyze it because I just didn't believe in it at all. And then I looked at how many students had signed up. Over 130 students had signed up. They wanted in. So we're talking about bumping out close to 40 kids from this honors class. And I said, wow, that's a big discrepancy here. 130 kids have signed up. How are we going to kick these kids out? And then I started going, wait a minute. I can run a report that shows distri grade, distri grade distribution by course. So I can see how many A's and B's there are in different classes. And imagine this. And in our honors section alone, there were 107 students who got an A or a B. So if you just use common sense, none of these formulas and assessments and tests were meaningful. If a student got an A or a B in the freshman honors class, why shouldn't they be allowed to continue, especially if they wanted to? Where did this random number of 90 come from? So this is a person who tried to take this on and, of course, got the slop beat out of him um, because what he found was that not only the teachers, but the parents who were in those exclusive classes didn't want them watered down. They did not want other kids to have that same access. And this type of thing comes up again and again, and I will say in the program that I teach in Berkeley's Principal Leadership Institute, it is geared towards urban education and to closing the achievement gap. That is what folks are trained to do. So it's not surprising that they look for areas where they see inequities where they might make a difference. So this isn't just a random story. I need to give that full disclosure. OK, so just a few facts about gate and schooling that I want to throw on the table here. Maybe there's some of my beliefs woven in. So I believe, there we go, there are some students whose needs cannot be met in a heterogeneous classroom. 
I believe that. My experience in working with emotionally disturbed children informed this. When I worked at Seneca Center, I was physically restraining children every single day. That was part of my job. While many of those parents, uh, parents of those children who had these special needs wanted their children in a heterogeneous classroom, the disruption would have been too profound. It wouldn't have been right. Likewise, we have an AIM class in our school, a GATE class, that's a self-contained class in fourth and fifth grade. And I do see, I have observed, that some of those kids would not function effectively in a heterogeneous classroom. I've observed that. So I'm leaving that one as a belief statement. But I'll follow it up by saying the vast and profound majority of children benefit with quality instruction in a heterogeneous classroom. A Couple other statements. In making decisions, there are often trade-offs. One of the things that I've learned is whenever access is limited, those who don't make the cut will become angry and frustrated. Um, where's our middle school principal here? There you are. How about when kids don't make a particular team or don't get the lead role in the drama program? Do you ever hear from parents in this community? Uh, in, in my community, I heard from parents. I had parents come to me and say, clearly the criteria you are using in selecting kids for the eighth grade boys basketball team is off. I know how my son plays. That's not uncommon. Likewise, when access is increased, you also get a different group of folks who are often angry and frustrated. What are you doing watering it down? You're lowering the level, you're lowering the quality. Next fact I want to point out, the determination of access in schooling is fluid. I won't say it's arbitrary, but we educators have discretion, like the story that I read about Mark and the honors courses. We have choice about how we sort children. Our decisions and our actions express our values. So let's talk about the Lafayette School District and where we were, where we've come, where we're going. I want to start by saying um, I love my district. Um, I think our teachers are extraordinary. Our principals are instructional leaders. They're doing incredible work. We do not have all the answers. What I like to say is sometimes it feels like we're stumbling in the right direction. And sometimes that's OK. In education, we're always looking for the silver bullet. There ain't one. There is no silver bullet. To ensure that all children are successful requires incredible perseverance, grittiness, collaboration, and what I would argue is data-based inquiry. So when I first arrived as an assistant principal and then principal, um, I have no idea when that was, a long time ago, uh, we had about 30% of our students that were gate identified. And by the time many of those children came to middle school, what we definitely noticed was that many of the non-gate identified children were outperforming the gate identified children, but were denied access to the gate classes. That was a problem. Even children who were struggling mightily behaviorally and academically who were gate identified, parents were, were clinging to the opportunity to remain in the gate self-contained classes. And we began a lot of discussions and, and self-analysis. I want you to know um, this is easier for me to be in this group because you're not my parents. I'm a little nervous about that video camera in the back there. <laughs> the hardest, one of the hardest meetings that I was ever at was my first meeting as a principal where I sat before these gay parents who said, 
you don't know what it is to be a gay, you know, child. And I said, you're right, I, I was not gay. I don't know that. And for two and a half hours, I was peppered with questions about the profound needs of this 30% of the population and how I needed to, as one parent said, create a gated community. I don't want my child, isn't that a great line? I don't want my child to be around people with lesser skills and abilities. That will drag my child down. And there were a lot of things that were said that were really uncomfortable. And at that point, we really didn't look at changing how we place and serve children in the district. But one of the things we also started focusing on th at that time, which was around 1996 or so, was character education. Um, more recently, we've adopted a program called Character Counts, but we invented our own. We focused on uh, respect and responsibility and integrity. Um, we did full days of respect with our students, with outside facilitators, cross grade level, to get kids to engage in a more caring, accepting, nurturing way. Um, middle school can be brutal for a lot of kids. It's when their bodies are changing so much and every kid feels different. So how are we creating great learning environments that feel safe so all kids can learn? And we did see, with the focus on character education, um, continued uh, declines in kids being sent out of class, classroom disruption, less problems out on the schoolyard. And when you looked at our Healthy Kids survey, more kids saying that they felt connected to the school, like they felt that there was an adult that they can talk to, uh, that cared about them. These are big data points to pay attention to. What I will also acknowledge is that our suspension rate, which w was relatively not low, we had about 50 suspensions a year in a middle school of 1,300 kids, didn't budge. So that the significant behaviors remain the same, but most of the children um, who were in there were benefiting and we saw data to support that, interesting data point. So it was at that point that we started saying, we need to have all teachers focusing on differentiation of the curriculum, of the instruction, of the type of assessments we provide. What I want to tell you, <clears throat> and now I'll go back to my experience as a high school English teacher, um, I was in Albany High School where I had kids coming to me at a fourth grade reading level and some kids who were in the same class reading at a college level. And we would read Romeo and Juliet and I remember stopping after every single line. What does this mean? How do we make meaning? There were other times where kids had to be assigned specific books according to their reading level. But I could teach a very heterogeneous class. Math, I, I understood that there, or believed to be, significant developmental differences in kids' abstract thinking that might prevent some kids from being successful in algebra. That was my belief. We'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> so we've, we did a lot of training, we did a lot of coaching, and we persisted with this, and we're going on about 15 years of doing thinking strategy differentiation work. The research on professional development for teachers is really clear. When you do the one-stop shop and you're done, oh, that was inspiring, that was great, and you don't pick it up, nothing happens. It's when you maintain a focus of effort over time and you engage teachers deeply in the work um, and provide opportunities for peer, evalu uh, peer not evaluations, observations and administrative support and coaching. So folks know this is not going away. This is what we do, this is how we do it, is when you get the traction. <clears throat> so in 2001, after lots and lots of community engagement meetings, and lots of training with teachers, we made the decision to use the LSAT, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychometrician, um, as a screening tool for gate identification. And we made the decision that we would serve only the profoundly gifted. I don't know if our district made that name up, but that's what we, we had, that was part of the nomenclature at the time. Now guess what? Folks who were in that 2%, we're really, really happy. And folks who weren't said, whoa, 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 my kid was just near the cutoff. 
I want a retake. Can't we use? You didn't measure this level of effectiveness. One thing we do know in GATE is that we're not, we don't have clear guidelines of how we measure giftedness and talent. Tidness, is that a word? We're not good at that. And it, from district to district, the tools and measures that we use and how we choose to serve kids who are gifted and talented, there's a wide variation of that. And what I can tell you right now is um, right now we offer this assessment, we have the self-contained class, and approximately, it changes from year to year, 28% of the children and parents who are assessed and qualify for our, what we call our AIM class refuse the service. They say, I just want to have my child served in their neighborhood school. We feel good enough about the quality of education that that's where we want our children. In fact, ironically, today I was at the CSBA conference and our enrollment, our class sizes are really high and we had some new kids move in and we had a parent say, I want my kid out of, uh, out of the, the self-contained class. It's not serving my kid. Um, that doesn't happen very often, but I want to say it's no longer got the golden ring aura that it once had. And I attribute that to the work of our teachers, the profound dedication. Our continual investment, even though these last five years financially have been miserable, we've continued to invest, uh, invest more than a quarter million dollars a year in professional development and coaching. Some of the coaching that we provide is real time. We'd have a coach standing next to a teacher. Pay attention to the kid in the back row. Have you asked him this question? Try this. I was in a classroom just last week before Thanksgiving with 16 other adults, 16 teachers and principals from the district. You would think, come on, you can't possibly do that without interrupting. The kids were focused. We were there to learn. The, the person who was doing this model lesson would do some instruction and then say, now teachers, here's what I just did. The beauty is, when you see on your next walkthrough, teachers trying it on. It doesn't always work. Teaching's really, really hard. But they're going for it. They're committed. And we have continued to have a profound focus on what I call data-based inquiry. Um, and I'll talk about, well, let me talk about that right now. What is data-based inquiry? So if you read the work of, um, Oh, Rick Dufour, Eaker, um, Hargraves. There's a whole bunch of folks who talk about professional learning communities. Raise your hand if you know about professional learning communities. PL says it's really a pretty simple concept. The experts in this business, teachers. Everyone else in the business, from custodian to counselor to secretary to principals to superintendents, we have one role, to support teachers. There is no position that's more important. That's where the action is. So the notion of PLCs is when you get smart teachers together and you give them data to look at, multiple data points to figure out which kids, and, and Dufour and Eaker identify three or four guiding questions. What is it kids should know and be able to do? That's your standards. They're gonna be changing to the common core. Number two, how do you know if they know it? That means you got to assess the kids. Number three, this is the deceptively simple question that's impossible. What do you do if they don't know it, haven't learned it, or already know it? That's where the differentiation piece comes in. That means you need to have layers of supports and interventions and opportunities for all kids. But when you get teachers together looking at student data, um, we use something that we call an assessment wall. So every single teacher in the third grade in a school will get together and they'll put all, the, every single kid's name is on a bulletin board with a little felt. And they have little notes attached to how they did on the sort and five or six different assessments. And the kids who are falling behind, they end up getting moved into different categories, different bands, so they get different levels of intervention. The kids who are accelerating, we make sure that they're getting served with some different types of texts and opportunities in the classroom. 
The coolest part about these meetings, which happen at least four times a year, is kids move. They're not stuck in a track based on a test that they had at one particular point. They move over time. That's beautiful. That shows growth. When one of the kids remains in a band, the teachers put their heads together and say, what are we going to do here? This isn't working. Essentially, what we've done is we've stolen from special education. We're creating an IEP for every child in the school. That's where the action is. I don't want to see a stinking spreadsheet with numbers. I want to know about individual children. How is each children growing and thriving or not? And what are we going to do about it? Hordes of time loading data into data director and assessments and tons of standards and pressure from parents. But we know our kids. And we know what's working and what's not working. When I was an English teacher, we didn't have a common curriculum. I, I taught before standards and benchmarks. It was like, what novels do you want to teach? What essays do you want to teach? What I found at that time were kids were really, really good at writing journal entries and poems, but couldn't write an ex expository essay. Standards and benchmarks are a good thing. So what we know is since 2003, after we came, became a more heterogeneous school, um, our district API has risen from 883 to 934. We had growth every single year except for one. So let me tell you one more big story. So math, and I shared with you my Piagetian belief that kids develop developmentally and that you can't really rush that. You guys remember, I, I took psychology when I was in college. Um, I can't remember the age of the kid, maybe three years old, and they have two different vessels, a long and thin one and a short and stout one, and they have, they have the exact same volume. And you show a, a kid at a certain developmental age, and you pour it back and forth, and you say, which one has more volume? And they say, the taller one. And you're like, no, 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 look. Look at the volume, and you pour it back and forth. And you say, which one has more volume? And they say, the taller one. Well, that was my argument when I was a principal at the middle school. We were serving about 40%, 45% of the kids in algebra in the eighth grade. Some kids are just not developmentally ready. I was one of them. I took algebra in the eighth grade, and then I had to retake it again when I was in high school. I didn't get it, and I also didn't work very hard. So 90, 90, 90 schools, what are they? They are schools that we have identified across the country that have 90% kids of color, 90% free and reduced lunch, and 90% proficient and advanced. We have models. We know it can be done. Some of them are those KIPP schools I was referring to. All kids can learn if given high expectations and the necessary supports. So some things that I learned. Um, it came to my attention from actually the high school principal that some of our kids in our lower track were really in bad shape and were not likely to get out of the lower track when they got to high school. And it was really putting them in jeopardy in a lot of different ways. And so we looked at the longitudinal data of kids in the lower track. What's the idea of a lower track? To accelerate kids, to bring them up to speed. What we found was that the longer a child was in the lower track, no surprise, if you want to hear it the crude way that it was said in, in my district, the stupider they got. A more politically correct way of saying that is, the longer our kids were in the lower track of math, the further behind they got. So the very programs that were designed to catch kids up were failing our children. Why? Pretty simple to me. And now, I'm, can we turn those cameras off for a second? <laughs> You know, I had a teacher who said, oh, you know those kids. I, I had a teacher who was loving the children to death. And not necessarily, and there's been a lot of studies that show, if you take two classes of, of equal performance and you tell one teacher, oh, these are rock star, brilliant kids, and oh, this is a slow group of kids, guess what? At the end of a year, that's what kind of results you're going to get. And that's what results we were getting in our district. So I did a lot of work with the teachers and a lot of work with 
parents, probably not enough work with parents. Had the conversations, and um, by the way, we have three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12. We had 14 tracks in the middle school, 14 tracks. And, and the middle school teachers were very, very clear that they needed to have those tracks because kids were operating at very different levels. So Rick Dufour, this great professional learning community guru, has a great article. It's called In Praise of Top-Down Leadership. And what he says in this article is, after you've provided the scaffolding and the research and the evidence and folks don't want to move, at the end of the day, you have to make a hard decision. And that's what I did. I said, we're getting rid of this lower track. And in the meantime, we had professional development going on for our teachers. Our teachers did not want to do this. They did not believe in it. And the parents went ballistic. You're going to dumb down my track. How dare you put those kids who can't perform around with my kids? Board meetings, parents lined up. Not quite this big a crowd. But they were vocal, and they were angry. And, um, and I was nervous. You know, I know I had done the, the research. I know I was making the decision for the right reason. I know my governing board was on board with this very controversial decision, but I was nervous. At the end of the year, we saw an increase in performance. This is the lowest bullet here. Uh, of proficiency and uh, proficient and advanced rates of 12% in one year. We jumped from a 77% proficiency rate to 89% in one year. Clap, please. It's a big deal. <laughs> now, that does not mean our work is over. That does not mean we may not backslide. What it does mean is when kids have access to the standards and teachers are committed to serving those kids that we can get more kids there. If you look at the top of them, we'll talk about algebra. So I'm hammering on the principal of the middle school saying, I want more kids in algebra. Because we had a 95% proficiency rate in algebra. So my belief was that's bad data. I did not like that data. Why? Because you're being too restrictive. Let more kids in. He's like, oh, you know, there's a lot of pressure. Math teachers aren't sure. Some of the parents don't think we can do it. So he moved 55 more kids, about 12% more kids into algebra last year. What happened to the proficiency rate? No change. No change. We provided more children access to a rigorous, the, you know, the old Dulciani algebra probably that you're familiar with with profound commitment to teaching thinking strategies, metacognitive practices, multiple pathways for solving problems, conceptual understanding, and we're maintaining the high level. So I'm, I'm upset. I want more kids in there. I want to see the proficiency rates drop. Sounds <laughs> counterintuitive, right? I want to see the proficiency rates drop because that means we're pushing more kids up. I'm still not ready to say, Every single child should be in there. Some schools have done that. I'm not there yet, but I'm moving in that direction. OK, let's talk about the Common Core for a quick second, and then we'll open this up to questions. Common Core is great. Um, I had one parent say, oh, this is terrible. We're giving up our local control, as though we had local control with California standards versus federal standards. But what I believe is when you look at data, a single data point on its own means nothing to you. If you said, kids scored a 77 on a test, that means nothing. What you have to know is, how did other kids do? How did the child do on a similar assessment last year? What are kids in neighboring school districts and across the state or across the country doing? I like the fact that we are going to know how our children are doing compared to every kid in the nation, except you heard Texas opted out and some other. Did you hear this? This is a true story. Texas opted out because they did not believe we should be teaching critical thinking to children. <laughs> true story. I'm not, I'm not making that up. Yes, it certainly does. Okay. 
So uh, according to Lucy Calkins, and our whole district is reading a book called Pathways to the Common Core, I highly recommend it. Very dense text, but if you want to understand what's coming down the pike, it's a great book. She talks about the Common Core is creating systems of continuous improvement that result in teachers teaching toward clearer and higher expectations and doing this work in more transparent, collegial, and accountable ways. Those are powerful words, every single one of them. So it's, it's building on the PLC um, model, but the California standards, I read one study out of Colorado that basically said, if you were to cover the current California standards, you would need, effectively and thoroughly, you would need 100 additional instructional days per year. So what has been said is that the standards currently are a mile wide and an inch deep. The Common Core is not about that. It's about doing deep and rigorous understanding using complex text. When I was an English teacher, I taught, I taught novels. I taught poetry, short stories. In the Common Core, and you walk into all of our classrooms at the elementary level, they have their little libraries. Tons of fiction, this much nonfiction. That's going to have to change. And it's all about rigor and use of complex text, critical thinking, use of evidence, and speaking and writing to inform, to make an argument, student engagement, depth versus breadth, focus on academic voca vocabulary. There are these smarter, balanced assessments coming out, using writing, where kids pull direct evidence from the text um, to measure comprehension and understanding. Um, so this is exciting work and it's, it's gonna be hard too. So considerations. So getting back to those great do four questions, as an educator we con continue to need to ask ourselves, what should our kids know and be able to do? And I suggest that it's, it's not limited to just academics. It's so much more than that. Number two, how do we know if they know it or are doing it? We have to have continual assessments, not just one stinking assessment at the end of the year that you get in the summer that I liken to an autopsy because the kid's already gone. The teacher can't do anything about that child. That doesn't help us. We need ongoing regular assessments, formative assessments, so that we can make adjustments. And then the big question, what do we do if they can't or already can? How are we teachers, educators, responding to that? So three questions, hard questions. Can schools change their role in reproducing the inequities in the larger society? Fact, we're doing that right now. We need to own it. That's what our values are saying are okay with us. How can we provide greater opportunities for more students, all of our students? And how do we sure ensure that all of our children are appropriately challenged? Um, hard, ongoing work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brill. Now is uh, our time for questions, and we've collected uh, some, so we're going to start. If you have any questions, you can send them to the, the end of the aisle, and someone will pick them up. Um, but we're going to start. This is the first one. It's actually two together. That's cheating. One at a time, please. <laughs> um, how does your district compare to Davis Joint Unified? The for example, the number of elementary students, junior high, high school, and um, how many children are in each class in, a, in the Lafayette School District? Okay, so um, we have about 3,400 kids in our district. We have four elementary schools ranging from 450 to 800 is our largest, and we have one middle school of 1,250 kids. Our class sizes are up to 24 grades K3, 29 grades 4-5, I understand. Um, and um, the middle school, there are about 30, I would say, in both academic and electives. And how, would, um, how does one teacher differentiate for 34 children? 
So let me say it again. It is brutally hard. And we have no choice. One of the teachers, I, I remember during the, um, the budget cuts, where we class sizes were going up, we still had some instructional aids, they were going down. The types of children in the classes are much more discrepant. We have more English language learners, more kids with special needs, more kids in poverty, even in Lafayette. Um, more kids who are medically fragile, kids who have diabetes and EpiPens and asthma. And the teacher's responsible for all of this. And they said, let me get this straight. You're taking, you're making the class sizes go up, you have a more diverse group, you're cutting my pay, and you want better results. Yes, is the answer. So one of the things that I like that our teachers are doing uh, at the elementary grades, for example, they're doing something called Just Right Reading Groups. So based on the assessments, they will cluster kids across the grade and go ahead and teach kids in for a particular unit, a particular book, or set of strategies that they've identified as being a gap. So there's way more collaboration and sharing of children. But at the end of the day, it does come down to um, maximizing the type of parent support. You, a lot of times, see parents in the classroom working with clusters of kids. That requires a whole level of work and um, enormous planning, which our teachers are doing more collaboratively now. But I want to be clear, everyone hears me. It's brutally hard, and there is no other choice. Thank you. How do twice exceptional gate identified and learning disabled children do in your district? No place for them with homogeneous gate classes. Are their needs met in heterogeneous classrooms with differentiation? And couldn't one attribute, wait, yes. could you read this one? Couldn't one attribute less interest in being in a self-contained 2% class to the children in that class having serious issues and especially poor social skills? So that's a really very, very powerful question. So again, I shared with you one of my biases. I have a strong belief and interest in alternative education and serving kids who have the greatest challenges. So I, I'm being upfront with you. That's a bias of mine. Um, there was a very, very important, I believe it's a federal case, um, about integration of kids with special needs. And we're allowed to use four different criteria for determining the appropriateness of placement. One of them is, is a child getting educational, Rachel Holland is the name of the case, the Rachel Holland case. See, 50 years old and I can still draw those out sometimes. So in the Rachel Holland case, is the child receiving educational benefit? Number two, is the child receiving social and emotional benefit? Number three, is it cost prohibitive? Guess what? Number three is fake. You can never use finances as a means for denying access. So scratch that one. Number four, does having the child there create, don't quote me on the exact language, a persistent disruption? What's a persistent disruption? Some might say if the child has an outburst once a year, that's too much. Some might say five times a day is too many. What I can say is our district is very intensive about integrating children with pretty significant needs. And does that sometimes become a disruption for other kids? Yes, it does. Um, do we continue to monitor and make sure that we're um, doing whatever we can to make sure that all kids are learning? Yes. I'm going to share uh, uh, just one other thing connected to this, and, and this is another growing evolving perception of mine about segregating kids out. When I looked at the children in Oakland who had multiply significant needs, multiple suspensions, expulsions, chronic truancy, um, failing four or more classes, I think when I was there I d identified more than four or 500 kids in the district. It's a big district. 
I don't know, there were 36,000 kids in the whole district. But I was outraged. These were kids who were in general ed schools, and that's what prompted me to start this community day school. What ended up happening, and, and I, you know, got you, you, for community day schools, you get double the ADA funding, so we could keep class sizes below 15. There's tons of money that can come in from the county, or there used to be, uh, early prevention, screening, treatment, and diagnosis. So we had $800,000 in mental health supports, and we were going to do an outdoor ed thing, and I was all excited. But guess what happens when you cluster kids with significant emotional and social difficulties? They look around, and the norm is to swear and to fight and to go off and not do your work. That's a change for me. I think, and this comes back to the character education and, and the Dr. Ken Ginsberg work that we were doing, that there's profound and tremendous value in having heterogeneous groupings and learning how to hang with all different kinds of folks and supporting each other. That's what I have to do in the workplace and all of you have to do. But there are extreme cases. If you remember my facts, which I sort of hedged my bets and called them beliefs, I don't believe that all children can be served in a heterogeneous classroom. And I believe that most kids with proper support and intervention, and that might mean a one-on-one -on -one aid three inches from a child ready to remove the child if he becomes disruptive, might be a way to help integrate. But that might not be enough. So that's one of my evolutions. I won't say all, but m most. Thank you. What effect, if any, has the new policy had on closing the achievement gap between your district's highest and lowest learners? We're making significant progress. Um, one of the other uh, huge changes that we had this year with our kids with special needs was we saw about a 15% increase in proficiency rates with our special ed identified children. And part of that is just more targeting, more intervention, shadow classes, and paying attention, saying we need to do something here. Um, does it, it the, the data that I just gave you includes 100% of our special education children. Okay. As a teacher, I feel quite comfortable teaching in a diverse classroom. I'm wondering what support and training you provided in your district specific to teaching GATE students. Did your staff feel the time spent was worthwhile? I just want to add these so you can no, go answer them all. Was it difficult to get the teachers to buy in to differentiated learning? We have some who would do it and some who do not. How do you get, uh, get, it, get it to be district-wide? Uh, wait, stop there, because that's a million-dollar question. Okay. That's so so I, I want to say something about this. You know, schooling, schools have been described as being egg cartons, where teachers go into their little different separate unit and don't really pay attention in many traditional schools of what's happening. And oftentimes there isn't accountability for what happens once they get their kids in their classroom. Number one, I want to say we have a um, assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction that's terrific. She just loves the work and works with teachers and is relentless in her pursuit of change and excellence in all teachers. What I want to tell you is we have teachers who do not buy in. I promise you that. But they are getting fewer and fewer, and the pressure on them, not from administrators, but from their colleagues to get on board, to get with the program, is huge. So we also have... Um, both external coaches and internal teacher coaches who have credibility with teachers who will work one-on-one. -on -one. They'll co-plan. They'll watch the lesson. So uh, I believe, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I talk about with my principals is uh, I call it the pressure support continuum. So 
if you are just all about being a cheerleader, yay, everything's great, come on, everything's not great, and we don't grow that way. Likewise, if we hang out on the other end of the continuum where it's all pressure, do it faster, higher, now, people shut down. No one wants to operate under the conditions where you feel like you're under a microscope and everything you do is not good enough, it's not right. So you gotta hit that sweet spot. But, but the word that does come to mind is relentlessness and over time is another one. And um, it, it, the word accountability comes up as well. It's the right thing. Y you know, when people wanna fight about do we have a moral, ethical obligation to effectively serve all kids, the low-end kids, the kids in the middle, the high-end kids? Oh, yeah. We have to do that. We have no choice. And when there's evidence that we're not doing that, we need to adjust. How was your district able to convince parents that this model was a viable method of providing for the needs of GATE students, especially after having self-contained programs? Um, so what I can tell you is, um, and, and I'll refer back to that Dufour article in praise of top-down leadership, I am not purporting or suggesting that you just go in and do something. You have to engage and educate and listen. And like I'm saying, I'm not saying we have the, all the answers. I want to say that again. And I'm also not saying that what we did in our district will work in your district. Um, but I do think it's important, and one of our processes was to look at the longitudinal data and find out which kids we were serving well, which we weren't, and what decisions we needed to make. There's another word I want to be very transparent and use. You have to talk about trade-offs. When there are limited resources, and sometimes even if there are limited resources, when you make a decision, you're expressing your values. And as a community, you all have to decide, are you happy with the way you're organizing yourselves? And the other part of that question is, are we looking at our own interest or that of the common good? I want to share a, a phenomenal data point. You're going to love this. So in Oakland, um, Oakland has the Hill Schools, which are very rich and primarily white and Asian, and then you have the Flatland Schools, which are primarily African American and Latino. The Hill Schools tend to be very high performing. 90 plus percent are going on to college. The Flatland kids, um, typically, for some of the African American males, they had about a 50 percent dropout rate from high school. and Definitely, I don't remember the exact rates, but we used to do this, and I think they still do it, uh, what we called a use your voice survey. And we asked our parents, is your school, your teacher, effectively preparing your child for college? Great question, simple question. The Hill School, 30, 40% of the parents said, you're doing a good job. Now 95% of their kids are going to a four-year college. Flatland school, 80 plus percent saying you're doing a good job preparing our children for college. That's sobering data. And it tells us a couple things. This is my interpretation. Number one, there's obviously an inverse relationship between parent satisfaction and student performance. So even though you can all be a pain a lot of times, keep doing it. Your advocacy makes us better. Don't back off. Be demanding, all of you, especially if your children are not being served. The other takeaway for me is that parents don't always know what quality instruction or education looks like. Not all parents do. And we have a responsibility to talk about what that looks like for all children. Isn't that an interesting data point? Have you considered using Carol Dweck's computer-based course for fourth through eighth graders 
that has been shown to improve academic performance and reduce disparities by teaching the growth mindset? I'm not all that familiar with it, and I will also tell you this. So our teachers are great, they're rocking, they're doing great work. The biggest complaint I get is, please do not put one more thing on our plates. New York Writing Project, this powerful math instruction, thinking strategies, all these assessments, do not, educators are great at loading more stuff on. We are horrible at taking things off of our plate. No. <laughs> I'd get killed. What grade level specifically did you push ahead the kids into algebra? So primarily in eighth grade, although we have in our district about 30 kids who are seventh graders who take algebra. And therefore we have, you know, it ranges from 20 to 30 each year who take geometry in the eighth grade. And we also have really angry parents when their kids don't qualify. Our criteria must be off. Can parents be given, or are they given homework to help their kids solidify what they learn? What's parents' role um, to support their teachers? Where do the coaches come from? So we do a lot of parent education. We want our parents to know how they can help their kids and how we're doing writing differently and reading differently and the types of higher order questions they can ask. We don't want our kids, when you're wrestling with difficult tasks, who was the main character? What did he do? What was the setting? That's all surface level stuff. We want kids engaging with the tasks in, for those of you old psych majors, Maslow's hierarchy, uh, is it Maslow? No, it's Bloom's taxonomy, sorry, Bloom's. So we want them comparing, contrasting, analyzing, um, making connections to their personal life, to other texts that they've read. Why? Asking the question, why would he do that? Making predictions. And those are the strategies that we teach our children, and we also teach our parents those. Our parents have loved going to these parent education. We've had great turnouts for them. I want to say this, and again, I'm going to give props to our assistant superintendent. She screens these coaches intensively. And we all know that the way in which content is delivered will have a profound impact on how it's received. So you can have two teachers side by side teaching the same stuff, and one's great and one's bad. You have, or less good. Um, you have a profound responsibility to make sure that the folks are resonating with teachers. And what I've really learned from watching this is our work is really grassroots. The teachers see and recognize the value. This is not you will. And that's a huge difference. Okay, this is a little tricky. I'm going to read um, three different people's uh, questions. Do you want to have Mike and Laura do it? <laughs> yeah. No, I just want you to be able to to synthesize it for me. Oh, higher order thinking skills. Uh -oh. <laughs> can you, so the first one, can you address how GATE students did with differentiation? You show how the lower and middle improve, but nothing about how GATE kids do. Are they increasing in their performance? Davis has many programs for struggling students, but few for the gifted. That's a now, great, uh, that's a. Are you going to stop me? No, no. Uh, uh, oh, do I have to synthesize all three? Oh, Two you're more. killing me here. Go Our ahead. district has gone from having one school with self-contained gate, historically a lower SES site, to putting gate at four wealthier schools. Gate enrollment has ballooned. Parents' values appear to be my child comes first over valuing the entire school community. Any thoughts on how we change those values? One more. And can you address how GATE students, did I, which one did I do? Oh, no. Tell me why I should sacrifice my child's elementary or junior high while teachers experiment with differentiation. Do I need to hide behind the podium here? 
So, so let me acknowledge a, a couple things. And um, when I hear those three overlapping statements, I hear a lot of passion and a lot of advocacy and a lot of concern for how a, a parent's child, assuming it was one parent or multiple parents, are going to be served. And those questions, while they can be uncomfortable, are good questions to be asking. I, I want to honor them. And I want to say that clearly there's profound emphasis across the United States to close the achievement gap. What does that mean? You focus on typically the lower performing kids and you try and move them up. Makes sense. W what we also know is, y you know, w when I work directly with teachers and I say, who are your focal kids? I always ask that question. Who are your focal kids? Because if they say, oh, I'm, I'm serving all of them, uh-uh. I want to know who you're targeting and why you're targeting and what you're doing differently to serve those children. And I want to acknowledge that not only can the gay kids, the higher performing kids get lost, but the quiet kids in the middle. I, don't, I, I haven't heard one question about the kids in the middle, not one. And again, what I would suggest is that number one, it's really hard. And, and I want to, again, continue to emphasize the advocacy, but I also want to talk about one of the cool new assessments that our teachers are doing. And this shows me how kids can go deep over time. So one of the things that they've done is they've given a short um, uh, uh, nonfiction passage to kids. And they have them write uh, uh, an analysis of that. They give some question in the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and the end of the year. And it's a beautiful assessment because you can see the kids change over time. They're writing, but more importantly, they're thinking the depth of their understanding. And what that tells me as we enter into this world of the Common Core, that I believe some of the big beneficiaries are going to be our gay kids. That the expectation is to go deeper and, and explain more nuanced, sophisticated thinking. Will all kids be able to do that? No. But that is going to be what the expectation and the push is. But I want to acknowledge that when you put your eye on one thing, it's easy to take your eye off something else. And that's where the parent advocacy comes in. Okay, I'm going to put these two questions together and they oh, go these along. double questions. They go along. These are our last questions. Right. They go along with what you just said and, um, and they won't take very long. Are the assessments goals for students teacher driven or district standard driven? And how are you really measuring former gate student, how former gate students are improving and being challenged? So, uh, ask it one more time because I want that was a complex question. Okay, so it's about assessments. Um, how, are the assessments and goals for students teacher driven or district standard driven? And how are you measuring how former GATE students are improving or being challenged? Mm -hmm. So, the first thing is it's a combination of teacher driven and district driven. There are some assessments that we say you will do, but the teachers have had a big hand in rewriting the formative assessments to really capture the kids' thinking in both math and writing. Um, and we use more canned programs for our reading. Um, one of the other tools that we use is we do a yearly survey, and one of the way things that we're continuing to check with all of our parents uh, is, our, uh, one of the things is, um, are we effectively challenging your child? And we do disaggregate that data according to self-reporting data. And our parents, for the most part, have been very, very satisfied with our program. Um, even, and I, I will say this, those folks that had concerns when we took away some of the lower levels and the upper levels became believers over time when they saw and observed and, and talked to their children. So 
w will I tell you that 100% of our parents are satisfied? No way. Are there still some people who wish we would do things differently? Yes. And that's the nature of working with large groups. You make decisions, some support it, and some will fight you every step of the way. But you have to do what you think is best for the whole. Well, I said that was the last question. Do you have time for three more? <laughs> three more. <laughs> Um, what process did your district go through in deciding to make changes in this direction? So uh, I was not the superintendent when we did the 30% to 2% for the gate program. That was led by our, a prior superintendent with, uh, as I said, a lot of input from teachers and a lot of community engagement. But at the end of the day, it was an administrative decision, as it has to be. If you take a vote, you're gonna give a split vote every time. So, um, and we pretty much can figure out where folks are gonna vote depending on where they are right now. So, um, the second part of that question was? That was, it w that was the one question. Good. What wow. process did your district go through? Yeah. Okay. And for, for this most recent one with the math levels, that was Fred driven with the support of my principal, the assistant superintendent, and again, engaging wider circles, math teachers, parents, and so forth. Okay, this will be our last question, and then if, uh, depending on how you feel, maybe people could ask you. Sure. How does, um, how does what's being taught with high expectations reconcile with a child's developmental readiness? I don't see any problem reconciling that. Even a child with low developmental readiness, and I want you to know there's new research even questioning that right now about that whole, um, that whole notion, that we still can provide the tools, the scaffolding, the support to make sure kids at all levels are successful. I really genuinely believe that. And I have deep and profound concerns when I hear teachers say that they don't share those beliefs. And, and I'll share something with you where I got in trouble. I misspoke, because I can get a little passionate sometimes. And when you know a teacher was saying, well, I don't believe all these kids can learn, and these are the same ones that showed the jump of 12% in proficiency rate, and I said what we are doing to children is criminal. Now, in some respects, when you are robbing children of future opportunity, there may be truth in that. But how that was heard by the teacher was I was calling her a criminal, which was not the case. And it, it shows how profound the emotion, the heart work. This is not just head work. It's not just hand work. It's heart work, too. And we need to be mindful of that throughout the process. But at the end of the day, I'm here for kids. I'm here for all kids. And if folks are going to stand in the way of our, of our effectively serving gay kids or middle-of-the-road kids or struggling kids, we're going to fight. We're, we're going to have to change practice. There's no other way. Thank you so much, Dr. Brill, for your time and Thank all you for your coming effort. Out. You've given us so much to think about, and we really appreciate everything. And, uh, and I don't want you to forget to, if you have interest in more information or being involved with other things or would like to give us comments or suggestions, the bag is right here by the door.